Having discussed how the external memory system is organized, let me now introduce the notion of virtual memory and physical memory. So previously we had seen that when you write a program, when you compile a program, and when you start executing instructions, this is the view that you have of memory, right? You assume that the text is down here, then you have your global variables that are defined here, you have a heap that grows in this direction, and then as you call procedures, you start placing things in the stack, and as you call even more procedures, the stack grows in this direction, right? So you have this view that memory is this contiguous portion of, of data that is at your disposal, and you can allocate data structures on this, on this contiguous memory. And you know, once you have the start of something, let's say you have the stack pointer over here, you know where your other data elements are simply by adding or decrementing an offset. Right? So all of this enab is enabled by the fact that you think that you have this large contiguous memory available to you. So in our 32-bit architecture that we've looked at, you're assuming that you can produce any 32-bit address and you can access that data. Right? So essentially, 32 bits allows you to access 4 gigabytes worth of memory. A more modern 64-bit architecture can allow you to access much more memory than that. Okay, but let's stick to a 32-bit architecture. And so you assume that you have access to a memory capacity of 4 gigabytes and that this memory is actually contiguous. Now this is just program number one. On a normal system, you've seen that there are several processes that are all running together. And each one of these processes thinks it has this contiguous large memory that is available to it. Right? So everybody thinks that they have access to this 4 gigabytes worth of memory. In reality, your processor is connected to a memory system, and this memory system may have a much smaller total memory capacity. Okay, so just for the sake of an example, let's say that you have 16 gigabytes worth of actual physical memory. Right? So this is the memory that actually exists. And you could have you know, hundreds of programs that are running together, and everybody thinks they have access to 4 gigabytes worth of memory. So if you do have, let's say, 100 programs, then to support the memory requirements of all of these 100 programs, you would need a total memory capacity of 400 gigabytes. And clearly, you don't have access to all that memory. Okay, so what's going to happen is portions of the memory of each one of these programs is going to get placed in this physical memory, and whatever does not fit is going to be placed on disk. Right? So the processor is also connected to the hard disk drive, which has a capacity of you know, many hundreds of gigabytes, even terabytes. And so a portion of that is reserved to store the memory that is not fitting in my actual physical memory. So this is sometimes referred to as the swap space. Okay, so portions of this memory are going to get placed here, and what does not fit is going to get placed over here. And so before you access any data, you're going to check to see if it's actually in the memory system. And if it's not, then you're going to move that page from the disk into the memory system, and then you can go ahead and access that data. And similarly, whatever used to sit here, since there's no more room for it, it gets placed into this swap space. Okay, so that's kind of how memory is organized. Now, this memory view over here is referred to as virtual memory because it does not really correspond to anything physical, right? This is just the view that I'm giving to the program. The program for you know, simplifying its interface and for simplifying the programming model is just going to assume that it has access to a large amount of contiguous memory. And that view that it has is referred to as virtual memory. And ultimately, the pages of virtual memory are going to get mapped to physical memory. Okay, so since I've mentioned the word page, let's explain what that is. So previously, we had seen that when you're managing the cache, everything is handled at the granularity of a cache block. That was a 64-byte entity or a 32-byte entity. And you were saying that you know instead of just dealing with four bytes at a time, it's more efficient to bring in a whole bunch of data at a time. That has a prefetching effect because of spatial locality. It also helps my tags become a little smaller. right? So we had introduced this notion of a block back then. Now, when you're dealing with main memory and disk, again, you want a little bit of a prefetch effect, and you want to manage data at a slightly larger granularity. And that granularity is referred to as a page. So when you're bringing something from disk into memory, you bring an entire page at a time. Okay, And that page usually has a capacity of at least 4 kilobytes. So most modern systems will have a smallest page size of 4 kilobytes. And many systems today also allow you to define pages that are much larger than 4 kilobytes. But for most of our examples, let's stick to this design. 
where a single page is about four kilobytes in size. Okay, so let me clear the screen out. Let me kind of draw this out one more time. So here's a program's virtual memory. And like I said before, it goes from zero to say four gigabytes. And here's my physical memory. And that could have a capacity of, let's say, 16 gigabytes with a large backup space in the hard disk drive. So when a program starts up, it says, you know, I need to allocate some memory so I can store all of my variables. So it makes a request for memory. And because memory is handled at the granularity of a page, I'm going to give an entire four kilobytes worth of space to my program. And so if my system has just begun, all of my physical memory is free. So I just pick the first four kilobytes of data and allocate it to this program. So this virtual memory gets mapped to this physical memory page, right? So this is virtual page number zero. And right now it's getting mapped to a physical page number. In this example, it's getting mapped to physical page number zero. Okay, and then this program starts to work. Then it gets context switched out. A different process starts up, right? So here's a different process that's starting up. It's going to allocate a few pages in its virtual memory. The operating system says, I can give you a few physical pages to map to this virtual memory. So this virtual page gets mapped to the second page here. This one gets mapped here and so on, right? So a whole bunch of programs could come in. And so eventually when our first program gets control of the processor again, it may say, I, I do need a little bit more memory. Let me allocate some more memory over here. And so virtual page number one for that program gets mapped to the next available physical page. And that could be this page over here, right? So page number four. So it gets allocated to physical page number four, right? So once the program has been, or once the system has been up and running for a while, and as a whole bunch of programs have executed and finished, you'll see that as new programs make requests for pages, you may get allocated to any page out there, right? Any free page out there. And if there are no free pages, then you may just evict the least recently used page and map the current request to that physical page, okay? So over time, the mappings of virtual pages to physical pages is effectively random, right? So over time, you may see that virtual page number two gets mapped to, you know, physical page number one million something, right? So some really large number, okay? So over time, these mappings go all over the place and there's really no pattern. So when you want to access data in, in physical memory, you have to first convert the address from a virtual address into a physical address, right? Because when the program makes a request for, you know, byte number 16, which is sitting in, you know, virtual page number zero, that virtual page number zero may over time have been mapped to some random location down here. And so to access the 16th byte in that page, you need to first convert the virtual page number to the corresponding physical page number. Once you've done that, once you've identified the page, you then go and pick out byte 16 from there and then send it back to the CPU. Okay, so any external memory access requires me to first convert the virtual page number to a physical page number. Okay, so how is that done? So every time the operating system maps a program's virtual page to a physical page, it keeps track of that mapping in a certain data structure. So that's referred to as a page table. So for every single program, the operating system has a page table. And that page table tells me that virtual page zero is mapped to you know, some address one million something. Virtual page two is mapped to some other address, you know, 768. And virtual page number three is mapped to a different, uh, different physical page number and so on. Okay, so the page table has all of this bookkeeping information that allows me to convert a virtual page number into a physical page number. Again, just to continue with this example again, let's say that every page has a size of four kilobytes. If my virtual memory size is four gigabytes, it means that I have a total of 1 million pages or 1 million virtual pages in my virtual memory system. That means the page table needs a million entries, right? So for each page in my, in my virtual memory system, I need one entry to keep track of which physical page it is mapped to. Similarly, if you have a 16 gigabyte physical memory system, that corresponds to about 4 million physical pages. So each one of these numbers tracks a number between zero to four million, telling me which physical page I correspond to. Okay, so now that you've seen how virtual pages are mapped to physical pages and you know how you need a page table to keep track of these mappings, 
This brings up the question about, you know, what does it take for me to access anything from, from physical memory? This tells me that once I've produced a virtual address, before I can go and access something in memory, I need to convert that virtual address into a physical address. And I do it by looking up this page table. Given that the page table itself is so large, it's got a million entries, there's a really good chance that this page table is not going to fit in my processor, right? It's not going to fit in all the caches that I, that I have implemented on my processor. So the page table itself is likely to be in memory. So in order to do this translation, I have to first do one memory access to retrieve my page table entry. That tells me exactly where I can find the data that I'm looking for, and then I do a second memory access. And that's clearly very, very expensive. Okay, so to simplify that process, on my processor, right, so here's my processing core, it's gonna issue, you know, load and store instructions. And then I have a small cache of my page table sitting on the processor. So I look up this cache, and this cache is referred to as the TLB, or the translation look aside buffer. And what it is, is just a few entries from my page table, right? So it says that from this page table, even though there are, there are a million entries, there are a few entries that I've touched in the recent past. And because of spatial and temporal locality, I'm going to retain these in my TLB structure. And I'm hoping that that subsequent requests are going to deal with pages that already have their translations sitting in the TLB, right? So out of this page table, maybe the most popular 64 entries or the most recently touched 64 entries are broadened and placed into the TLB. So if I have a TLB hit, then just looking up the structure in a single cycle converts the virtual address into a physical address. And now I can go out and get that data from main memory. If I have a TLB miss, then I now have to do multiple memory accesses. I have to first go into memory and you know extract the page table entry over there, put that into my TLB, then I redo my request. Now there's a TLB hit. Now I know exactly where the data is. And then I go and get it from main memory. Okay, so if the TLB is very successful, then every memory access is indeed a single physical memory access. But if I have a TLB miss, then you could potentially be looking at multiple memory accesses just so you can figure out where the data is.